Praise the Lord. Reverend Culver and I sincerely hope that you had a Merry Christmas. Oh, I know this was such a different holiday, but celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ should give us all pause to be thankful and grateful for this wonderful season. Hallelujah. Now, this is our last lesson of the year, and it is a very fitting title, Get Ready. Glory to God. So now, let's get ready. You have your Bibles and your Pathway series, and, 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 and let's get ready to dig in. Wonderful. So glad you're here with us today. Our scripture lesson is found in Matthew, the third chapter, the first through the 12th verse. But first, let us pause for a word of prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for your darling son, Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, we do, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because it was your sacrifice to this sinful world that you gave your only begotten Son so that a sinner like me might have the right to eternal life. Thank you, Father. Now, Lord, look upon each person who is now tuned in to this meeting. Bless their going out and they're coming in. Continue to cover us with your blood, your healing blood, that cleansing blood, and we will be careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory that you most richly deserve. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Now, you have your Bibles and your Pathway series, as this uh, lesson is written by Dr. Javon Marshall, a writer for the Sunday School uh, Publishing Board, uh, which is an auxiliary of our National Baptist Convention, where uh, the Dr. Jerry Young is our general uh, president, and we'll also be taking excerpts from our flashlight. Our scripture reads on this wise. You have your Bibles open. In those last days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at Hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Mm. Then he went out to him in Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan confessing Yes, their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, All generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, 
and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able uh, of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor mm. and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And the word of the Lord is blessed. Now, saints of God, why is this lesson important? Well, child of God, important projects require thoughtful preparation. What endeavors demand our deepest efforts in preparation? Hmm. Well, John called for people to repent of their sins and thus be ready to welcome the soon coming Messiah. Hallelujah. He was on his way. Now, in our introduction, as the curtain closes on this current year, a new year is on the horizon. And many times it is accompanied with, you know what, a floodgate of new, you got it, resolutions. Seeing that we have endured a pandemic of epic proportions, we have seen so much death, heartache, we've seen misery throughout the land. Currently, we are holding our breath, not knowing the diabolical antics that our current president might uh, uh uh, may come to pass, we don't know. Everybody is just gripped. We've all found ourselves at the beginning of a new year making res resolutions, and many, you know it, we don't keep them. But this year, saints of God, it is different. Looking at changing old habits like overeating or never being on time for work or church or watching uh, too much television pales in comparison to what our hearts have now led us to, mm, that's right, really do. You see, old habits bring you back around to the same situations over and over again until Suddenly, you are stuck in a cycle. But the solution is simple uh, than many really seem to realize. Those of you who have been, that's right, sincere in your reflections of your life uh, since we have been quarantined in this pandemic, hopefully, have realized that the first step to breaking bad habits is true repentance. The first step of real repentance is honest acknowledgement 
of bad behavior and that's right its source you see child of god change begins with taking responsibility of self-defeating personal habits we all have them ask yourself what am i doing to encourage the very behavior that i want to change it's a good question think about how you got to where you are the power of spiritual repentance is the remorse or regret that moves one to make meaningful and measurable change. Child of God, the greatest resolution on earth will fail before you speak them if old habits are not replaced with, that's right, new ones. Resolutions have no power without discipline, effort, and, that's right, a change of mind. And change only happens when we acknowledge wrong attitudes and behaviors and sincerely seek to do something different. With a truly repentant spirit, a contrite heart, and a commitment to do work, you know what, child of God? You can do absolutely anything. With or without a New Year's resolution, the Apostle Paul told the church at Philippi that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Now, our lesson begins with uh, John the Baptist coming on the scene with a startling message and uh, a startling appearance. Ooh, that was something. Uh, Now, he does not dress in the clothing of a more Uh, civilized society? No, he doesn't. He doesn't look the part. And although John lives on the edge in, in, in the wilderness of Judea, he comes with a message for the whole society, even to those at the very center of religion and, that's right, and politics. He had a brilliant message. See, the words of John the Baptist, just like those of the prophets before him, were confrontational appeals to repentance and righteous living. Now, as we look at the scriptures in detail, in Matthew, the third chapter, one through three, you still have your Bibles. In those days is a description regularly used to introduce a new departure or significant event or even a birth when they said in those days. Okay. So Matthew uses the phrase to announce the coming of John the Baptist. Now, John comes proclaiming, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see that in verse number two. Hallelujah. Now, the kingdom of heaven is Matthew's term for the kingdom of God. In using this term, he is respecting his Jewish members' sensitivity about pronouncing the divine name using a lot of respect. Now, this announcement of the kingdom common to both John and Jesus 
signals the imminent arrival of God's reign in this world. Hallelujah. Then John speaks with this thunderous voice demanding a new relationship with God. The word repent or manatonia is a striking command that calls for an ongoing complete change of mind and action. This would be an ongoing thing. It means a change of heart, a turning away from a certain path or an arrival of, that's right, a different view. Glory to God. So in verses four through six, Matthew writes that John, is a messianic forerunner in terms of Isaiah in verse 3, and now his dress is reminiscent of the wilderness prophet Elijah, both in terms of his coat and his belt. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. That's in Zechariah of uh, 13 and 4. And then we see in 2 Kings 1 and 8, and they answered him, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. You see, God is clearly no longer silent, and the centuries of waiting are over. The Messiah is on his way, and the people of God must, that's right, get ready for him. John saw himself as a wilderness prophet, a somber man committed to discipline and self-denial, called with a stern voice for people to repent and return to God in verse 4. Oh, they could hear him all over the place. Now, the response to John's appearance and, and, and his message is incredible. People began to come from everywhere around, not only Jerusalem, but the whole of Judea and even the entire area around, that's the Jordan. They came from all over. The point is that John had a great impact on the people. John preaches repentance to the crowd and the people confess their sins, and are baptized. Baptism is right, y'all. Now, let's look at the warnings to a brood of vipers. We see that in verses 7 through 10. You still had your Bibles open. The surge of response to John's message provide Matthew with an opportunity to present the religious leaders in a negative light as seen throughout Matthew's gospel. He did not paint a pretty picture of these people. Along with the crowds come, they had many Pharisees and Sadducees. But John stops them short with a blistering attack. The leaders demonstrate failings that are detested by this gospel. When, when these haughty religious professors who give no evidence of repentance come with the rest, you know, seeking baptism, John rebukes them harshly saying, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath 
that's to come. You see that in verse 7. John calls them vipers. He means that they are spreading poison like, like a snake, like an old serpent. Mm, mm, mm. You see, saints, the wrath of God is not just anger, but the inevitable condemnation by a holy living God of any sin which defiles God's creation and which destroys the dignity of humanity as a part of creation. Let us look at this in real time, saints of God. There are those who will have hell to pay for standing by, watching the death and destruction of hundreds of thousands of lives, homes, livelihoods, everything, in 2020, as if uh, uh, it was their civic duty. John called them vipers. Now, the Jewish leaders turned against God's plan by elevating their understanding of the Torah above God's will. They were about to reject God's prophet and his Messiah. Thus, they are rebuked by John and warned of the judgment to come if they do not bear fruit worthy of repentance. You see that in verse 8. So Matthew uses John's critique to once again emphasize the theme of, get this, Gentile inclusion. The theme is implied in John's claim that God could raise up children of Abraham from these stones. You see that in verse number nine. Now we see the coming Messiah in verses 11 through 12. Now we get to the focus on John the Baptist ministry. John points ahead and beyond himself to another person. John has a powerful place in God's history of salvation, but he knows it is only preparation for the get this, that main event. Calling the nation to repentance is important, but it is not the main event. The main event is the appearance of the one who will inaugurate God's kingdom on this earth. Now, although there is continuity between the messages of John and Jesus, John especially emphasizes the contrast between himself and the coming one. John's baptism is uniquely associated with repentance, but as unique as it was, it was only preparatory to the baptism associated with the coming one. Stay with me now. The coming one will baptize the repentant, those who are prepared to receive him with the blessing of, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit. You see that in verse 11. But, child of God, the unrepentant, those who are not receptive to the coming one, he will baptize with the judgment of eternal fire. That's hell, y'all. Now, what you want to be baptized with? The impact of this message on John the Baptist audience must, must have been profound. It was profound on me. 
because they are gathered with mixed motives. John is drawing a line in Israel that is intended to test the hearts of all who hear. The repentant will form the nucleus of those who receive the expected one's gracious ministry. Mm. Now, as we conclude this lesson, the abrupt appearance of John in Matthew's gospel is a matter of intentional theological design, not a literary coincidence. Mm -mm. Humankind may temporarily frustrate the redemptive purpose of God, but in the end, guess who wins? God will win. History is not only on God's side, but it is under God's command. I'm about to shout right now. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The, the, the actions of God in history, you know, are often sudden unexpected, and, and, and to our eyes may be really intrusive. Pandemic, anybody? God's will does not always work gently. Help us, Father. <coughs> Climbing quietly like ivy up the lattice of history. Mm -mm -mm. Sometimes, and Elijah appears, a nation repents, a Berlin Wall is dismantled, a Martin Luther King strides across the landscape, a George Floyd lays down his life, calling for his mother, sending a message to the world. God's will shatters the mold violates the categories and breaks in on the world as a jarring surprise. So, the doors of Matthew 3 suddenly swings open and there stands John in the wilderness of Judea looking for all the world like Elijah of old. His surprise appearance is itself a claim that God's way with the world are often strange unforeseen, and unpredictable. Hmm. Let us pray. Dear God, instill in us the willingness to be set apart for your service. Help us not only to hear your call, but also to heed your call for preparation. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and create in us a clean heart. Get us ready to be the kind of servants you need to be in order to affect your redemptive purpose upon this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. And let the church say, Amen.
got a role. Thank you for tuning in to Sunday School with the Jerusalem Missionary Baptist Church located at 1747 Fillmore Street, right in the heart of Gary, Indiana. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson and that you'll come back again on next Sunday for another word in Sunday School. Jerusalem, you've been doing so great with your giving. Continue to give. Let us continue to stay connected, love one another, and let us pray one for the other. I am your host and superintendent, Evangelist Janice Culver. Brothers and my sisters, the devil want to fool you and have you confused and think God wants to hold on to your past, but he's not a God like that. He wants you to see where you that came from, and then he also wants you to look ahead of you to see your future. Now lift up your hands and tell him.